like his latest single. We all can feel gratitude for living during this man's career. Maybe it's because he's Canadian, or because he has one of the most unique and powerful voices in his history, or because he is simply a power Share the feeder cat if you haven't already done so, or else it and Devin will be really angry with you. Okay, let's get to it. Devin Garrett Townsend was born on May 5th, 1972 in New Westminster, British Columbia, Canada, which is near Vancouver and still lives in the surrounding suburb today. Married to Tracy Turner, the two have been together since the age of 19. They have a child together, Rainer Liam Johnston Townsend, born on October 4th, 2006. In high school, he was in a number of heavy metal bands, including Grey Skies and Caustic Thought. He was also a touring guitarist for the Canadian rock band The Wild Hearts in the early 90s. But at age 20 in 1993, he got a call back from a record label after Steve Vibe came across his demos and asked him to join his band on their upcoming album, which was called Sex and Religion. He blindly accepted, as any kid would do. It was while Vi and Devin were promoting for the album that most of us first became aware of him, especially via the show Headbangers Ball, which still to this day, Devin accounts for one of the most rewatched moments in MTV history. Also, check out our latest episodes on King Gizzard, Nightwish, and also Blood Incantation we think that you'll love. They also made a number of national TV performances, including The Tonight Show. After recording and touring with Vi and the Wild Hearts, he grew discouraged by what he found in the music industry and felt he was becoming a musical whore. He received a phone call from an AR representative of Roadrunner Records expressing an interest in his demos and an intention to sign him. But the fee fueled to the fire. The offer was rescinded by the head of Roadrunner, who regarded Townsend's recording as just, well, noise. He faced further rejection by numerous record companies, even by Relatively Records, who he had worked with while with Steve Vai. Finally, Century Media Records contacted him and offered him a contract with one simple request. Just be you, Dev. Make it as extreme as you like. Devin would agree to the five album deal in 1994, which became both a blessing and a curse. This allowed him the opportunity to release his frustration under the name Scrapping Young Lab, which of course immediately showcased the humor in him. Initially, it was just a solo project as the debut released in 95 entitled Heavy as a Real Heavy Thing was all him. He wrote, mixed, produced, and played all instruments on it. The album may have only sold a few hundred copies in his first year and led Century Media to question their decision, but critics generally were positive towards it because what was not in question was him delivering on something unique and extreme. For its time, it was one of the most disturbing albums you could possibly hear. Heck, it starts off with Devin pretending to be a 3 old child saying, This is Play Devi. Spell Devi. I like me who wants to play. Play to Devi? And then once there was a bear out there, a real life bear, and he ate the kids. And it ends with a song called Satan's Ice Cream Truck, sandwiched in between our death, thrash, industrial, and pre new metal songs. And if you didn't believe me that this album was him releasing his frustration on the music industry, well, read those lyrics. Definitely rough around the edges. And whereas I personally enjoy his demo work from 86 and 94 a little more, which you can hear by his ass sorted demo albums, it did lay the groundwork. He continued to blow off steam with his first solo concept album, which tells the story of a fictitious death metal band from South Central Poland called Cryptic. Corridor. As the story goes, during a gig, their guitarist breaks a string, oh no, and the band is forced to improvise and tune up to play punk rock instead. The band accidentally becomes an overnight success and decides to sell out their metal look and sound to become a commercial punk rock band called Punky Brewster, a pun on the 1980s US television series of the same name. Again, humor would play a big part in his life, and his album is just wickedly fun. He claims the album took a week and a half to write, six days to record, 12 hours to mix. For the sophomore release of Strapping on Lad, he decided to assemble a true band. Two of the members were sort of involved on these first two discs. Bassist Byron Stroud was the photographer for Heavy as a Real Heavy Thing, an additional vocalist on Punky Brewster, which guitarist Jed Simon also did some background vocals on. Three of them were also in the band called Caustic Thought while in high school. After Devin left the Wild Hearts, he decided to move to Los Angeles, where he slept on a mutual friend's couch. It was there where he wrote Bolt City and Ocean Machine, which were the sophomore releases for Bolt Strapping and his solo career. Bolt actually were influenced heavily and inspired by Los Angeles, along with, in the case of City, also the Battle Angel Alita Magna series from the 90s. He was also there where he met Gene Hogan. In classic Devin fashion, he claims he knew nothing about metal music, but he did think it would be easy for him to make the most extreme metal album imaginable. And Gene was the most extreme drummer he knew, so he asked him to join Strapping Young Lab. Gene, who at the time was with Chuck Schuldner and Death. Yeah, you know, the greatest death metal band ever. And before that, as a kid, he was with an equally gifted and arguably first ever prog death metal band in Dark Angel. Why Gene left Chuck for 
for this completely unknown, unestablished Canadian is unknown. Other than Gene has indicated being blown away by Devin after spending time with him. Regardless, Devin was spot on about the importance of him. He is, after all, nicknamed the Atomic Clock and the Human Drum Machine for a reason. His creativity arrangements and trademark double kick drum rhythms, not to mention point blank accuracy, is legendary. Besides Devin himself, and not taking anything away from Byron and Jet, but the combination of Devin and Gene would wind up creating one of the most powerful forces in music history, which is probably a hell of a debate. Gene and Chuck or Gene and Devin? Obviously, it's a stupid question as both are iconic. Either case, their sophomore release, City, came out on February 11th, 1997 and altered the extreme metal scene forever. Speaking for myself, I have been a loyal Townsend and Hogan fan for life since. As for the other album, Ocean Machine, which also came out a little later in 97, marked the first time using his real name. Both City and Ocean Machine are regarded as his masterpieces, so apparently good things happen when Devin is in LA, but they could be more different from one another. Where City was metal, frantic, and intense, Ocean was a rocker, yet energetic, but also gentle and mysterious. I remember at the time making a tape I called Ocean City, where I combined songs from both into one bio mix tape. It was epic. Great for mowing along to. Speaking of epic, the last four tracks of Ocean are out of this world. One of the best stretches of music ever. And the album also comes with arguably his most well-known song in life, A Beautiful Rocker. He then quickly followed up Ocean with another solo album under his name, Infinity, which introduced the world to his more theatrical and musical side. It also came with a live staple on his Bad Devil, a fun, bluesy rocker. But Devin, as we all know, was also busy at work. And even before all of this, during the time in LA, he unexpectedly came into contact with Jason Newstead of Metallica. Yep, you can thank Devin for getting Jason fired from Metallica. Devin, the home wrecker. Kidding. But in all seriousness, it was the blow that broke the back, according to stories from all of them. Jason and Devin were working together on the next project called Physicist, which they described as being more extreme than even strapping him lad. But Metallica made sure to put an end to this project. This came after they found the IRA demo in 94 that included them working together. It pissed them off, which came on a very different time in their lives that, well, say now, where they just wouldn't have cared. This forced Devin to continue the rough idea, which became his latest solo disc called Physicist, released in 2000. It is his most disliked album, in large part because it comes off as a half-baked idea, thanks to what went down. But this didn't stop Devin from pushing forward. Terrier in 2001 is a prog metal masterpiece, melodic and atmospheric. It was an opportunity for him to combine all his elements up to this point, and was inspired by his homeland. It was an introspective look of where he grew up in southwest Canada. When listening to it, it makes a ton of sense. Also, very well produced. Probably to counteract the rough production and heard on physicists and poor reception that came with it. It comes with a number of staple songs like the epic Earth Day, the emotional solo-filled deep piece, and the larger-than-life theatrical ballad of Nobody's Here. Accelerated Evolution, released in 2003, is often overlooked, which is odd considering it has one of the most well-known and best songs ever in Deadhead. Look, Dev, it gets confusing when he kept changing band names. Accelerated Evolution was created as a counter-energy to keep him sane while writing Striping Young Lads third album. It shows as at the time it was his most accessible, with a more alternative rock sound and delivery. This balance of energies is something he would often do moving forward. And speaking of energies, writing and playing for Strapping Young Lad came at a cost for Devin. Again, a blessing and a curse. In 98, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, a condition that unknowingly was heightened by his alcohol and drug use at the time. Plus, the intense life that came with the persona he created through Strapping Young Lad, split and all. Something he struggled with for the next 10 years. Anyone who listens to Strapping can understand why this might be. Reluctantly, and despite frustration mounting against Century Media, Devin did release three more albums with Strapping, thus fulfilling their contract agreement. It's unfortunate the damage that had resulted as Strapping Young Lad is still to this day highly regarded. Those three additional albums in their self-titled 03, Alien 05, and The New Black in 06, along with City, had been cherished and loved by many. Devin, Gene, Jed, and Byron made something truly one of a kind. Thankfully, it will live on forever as we can always relive that intensity they deliver on as being, for their time, arguably the most extreme metal band in the world. Dev Lab 04 and the Hummer 06 are super trippy experimental electronic pieces. That was his first trip away from a guitar-centric focus, which he has indicated always is how he writes at first. As for Syncastra in 06, which was originally named Human, is sort of similar to Terrier, but pushes his progressive qualities even further. And as a 
little circus-like quality to it thanks to Baby Song and the catchy Vampolka and Vampira. While the album is split into separate tracks, it is one single piece of music sharing common themes as a prog rock album would, and originally it was to include a full orchestra but not enough money at that time. The six albums would balance his bipolar energies, now given the chance he put an end to strapping on Lad, became sober and free of all anti-psychotic medication and drugs. But as a result of becoming free, it made him feel even more exposed and vulnerable than ever before. He also feared backlash for ending strapping, which was starting to become a headline band. As a result, he decided to shield himself and deflect that energy away from himself and create a fictitious character to act as a punching bag. Ziltoy, the omniscient, was bored, and with it came his love for puppets, Broadway, and storytelling. He says he was embarrassed by it at the time, and his mom telling him that he was crazy for busting out his puppets, which that story is made even more relevant as Jim Henson always got made fun of. Well, like Jim, who's laughing now, Ziltoy, besides being the perfect shield, became a success and bought a new fan base with him, not to mention much needed merch, aka money. It also allowed him to evolve a stage show, bringing more support, props, and overall stage show presence, which you can see on the Retinal Circus and Ziltoid Live video albums. For those who do not know, Ziltoid is an alien from another dimension, specifically that of Ziltoidia 9, and ends on a quest to find the ultimate cup of coffee. If a planet does not, he destroys it. The story picks up as he arrives on Earth and is freaking brilliant. It also marked the first time Dev used the Drum Kick from Hell EZ Drummer software machine created by Meshuggah's Drummer. Once complete, he took a year long break after away from everything to spend time with his family and reset his life while reflecting or re reviewing some 60 song ideas that he had laying around notice they all fit into four distinct styles he decided to cut off his trademark skull and hairstyle and the thousands of means that came with it and moved on to his next epic project the devon townsend project originally only meant for four albums three more project arcs though followed the original consisted of four entirely different emotional themes coming together in one form kai kicks things off with a mostly acoustic focus and captures the calm before the storm. Every song pretends to build on something heavy, but it never does. That result is electric, and one of the most unique in his catalog, also very bluesy. Kaya also, along with Disc 2, Addicted, came out in 09. Addicted is a straight-up alternative rocker and showcased the beloved ex the gathering singer Anna Kate. Always been popular amongst fans. Disc 3, Deconstruction and 4, Ghost, both came out in 2011 and could not be more different from one another. Deconstruction is very much strapping on lap, but even more bombastic. Worth noting that throughout his career, he has always changed up who he plays with, with the goal to match the energy of each idea through many great musicians. This one was no different, and it came with a lot of guest vocalists to capture this wild story and all its characters. It's an intense ride. Ghost, on the other hand, is his softest, most gentle, and peaceful album to date, like a spiritual new age, mostly instrumental meditation. He would tour extensively for the four, and it created an epic live show, with each night focusing on each energy. It was truly special. The Containers box set will show you. The next project came as a surprise to even Devin. The plan was to work on the sequel to Ziltoy, but every time he sat down to write, everything came out positive and alternative. In this new state of being, he decided to run with wherever his emotional spirit wanted to take him. The result was Epicloud and bonus disc Epiclouder, which was very alt-friendly. Mixed with a few heavier moments, notably a remake of his old song Kingdom of Physicists. The album is in the double entendre, being both among the clouds as the band had been flying along a lot while on tour and represented his trademark wall of sound production heard throughout his career. And it seems his spirit was still not ready for Z2 as Casualties of Cool came next in 2014. For this one, he yet again created a new band name. The idea was to see what comes out of two creative forces working together, with both giving equal creative freedom. That being Dev, plus the beautiful and soulful Shay Ami Dorval. Dev met Shay through his bandmate and musical bestie Dave Young, who was teaching her at the time. Dev brought her on for a background singing on Kai, which fast forward thought would be perfect for this creative idea. Casualties is story and film. The arc follows a man marooned on a hostile planet, being lured there by a voice of a siren that ends up being the purveyor of mortal game. The game is a metaphor for the relationship between men and women, selfishness and accountability, and ultimately the relationship between an artist and himself. The story starts in darkness and ends in light. Casualties as a bridge represents the process of getting through the dark to arrive at creative freedom that cannot exist without going into the dark and confronting the fear of oneself. As you can see, it's a personal story to death, and shockingly, a warning of what was about to come in just a few leaders later. It sounds like Haunted Johnny Cash or the Twin Peaks soundtrack. Heck, in 2017, Lynch brought Twin Peaks back. He should have just used these two to do the soundtrack. It's late night, completely isolated, mysterious, ambient, country, space rock at its finest. The nine tracks intended for Ghost 2 became the bonus test given the similarities, which leads to 
the sequel to Ziltoid, entitled Z2, pronounced Z squared, which acts as Ziltoid against the world. Released also in 2014, it's broken down into Sky Blue Disc 1, which essentially is a continuation of Epic Cloud and Disc 2, Dark Matters being the actual sequel to Ziltoid. It was the first time Devin used fan-participated choir tracks, which you'll find yours truly on. And Z2 took a very different approach to Z1, in that little of Ziltoid himself was actually on it, and a lot more talk track to explain the story, which made it sound a lot more like a true musical. It also introduced a lovable poser character. They also did an awesome performance of it in full at the Royal Albert Hall, on to Transcendus and Bonus Disc Holding Patterns. The final album of the Devon Townsend Project, at least for now, released in 2016, it marked a return of Singer Anarchy, as with Shay also continued, and a return to traditional prog metal similar to Terry and Sequestria. Pure stats in mind, it's his most popular album to date. He also did a show with the orchestra and choir of Povida State Opera at the Ancient Roman Theater. Truly epic and a long time coming. So, Devin Townsend Project is over. Now what? Well, he decided to explore the idea of what would happen if he merged every style he has played with up to this point. Turns out, he delivered on the idea and got a new crew of musicians to come with it. Plus, brought back many old friends, including even Steve Vai made an appearance. Empath, released in 2019, not only included all the styles, but also, shockingly, worked out really well as a cohesive album. A bold accomplishment. Unfortunately, the tour got cut short thanks to, you know what, which is a bummer because it was his best tour. Navarro, Morgan, Shay, and the rest of the members outdid themselves. I've seen Dev like 12 times live. This was his best. You can at least least see some of it what I mean on the Order of Magnitude video album, which leads us to the projects he worked on during the pandemic. The Puzzle and Snuggles, the most bizarre work he has done up to this point. Well, the puzzle that is. Snuggles essentially is a continuation of Ghost, but nowhere near as successful. The Puzzle is an elaborate and more focused version of his album Death Lab back in 2004, a collaborative multimedia art project that acts as a creative release for him. It represents that there is light at the end of the darkness. The puzzle is chaos, Snuggles is calm. Some think the idea stems all the way back in 97 when he thought of the chain letter idea, which made sense when you listen to it. The idea was that Dev would send a broke working project and each member would then add on to it, morphing into a collaborative mind at work. Regardless, the puzzle acts like a memory or a remembrance of sort of his career up to this point. And the box set, which is, yes, expensive as all hell, is quite the interesting idea and came with a graphic novel and many toys to represent different emotions and a cute public name snuggles. Interestingly enough, it reminds me a lot of a puzzle box I created back in the day in 2009 for David Lynch Film Festival. Lightwork and Nightwork was also worked on during the pandemic, but presents itself as him reflecting on his life post-pandemic. Released in 2022, only difference between light and night is thematically night was too dark for the main disc. Whatever it is, man does this guy's well of ideas never run out. Outside of a couple tracks on the night side, this might be his most accessible and radio friendly yet, with endless forms of positive emotions bursting out from the void. It also might be his most experimental. This leads us to his latest album, Power Nerd. And if you've been paying attention, yet again acts as a calm before the storm for his latest project. The positivity and sickness of Power Nerd will soon be contrasted by follow-up The Moth and Extol, which will literally represent the life of a man from birth to, well, life beyond. It is expected to be over-the-top, dark, and uncomfortable. And finally, his dream of writing directly with a full orchestra and doing an official full-length musical will be unleashed. As for our review of Power Nerd, that will come on another episode, plus another episode on Devon showcasing his greatest strength and we Weaknesses. Plus, you know, we can't resist Graphic Metal where we reimagine the branding and many of Devin's album covers. So subscribe and stay tuned for more great stuff on Devin. Check out our latest episodes we think that you'll love in Blood Incantation, King Gizzard, and I Wish. Until next time, I'm Vitor Von Wright. You've been watching Graphic Metal. Cheers and keep on rocking. Hey, that's good.